Live from the nation center here in Nairobi, our top stories tonight. Tonight, Treasury is covering all the bases ahead of Budget Day. But the senators are rallying their bases. The Treasury should not flout our law, our constitution, the way they want to do. There is no budget. How the battle for county cash threatens to derail Treasury's budget plans. Also tonight, the third rail in the SGR mystery. I don't know how that happened, but they used the wrong address. Mm -hmm. Their headquarters is in the uh, terminus. The mystery local company running SGR has a fictitious address. Thus, Ebola claims its first victim in Uganda. His grandmother and his, his brother, his younger brother, three years old, have also tested positive. Kenya is now on high alert. And also tonight, Nairobi residents benefit from Nairobi County and Jambo Pay Spat. So let the Nairobians enjoy free parking. What is the big deal? NTV Tonight with Mark Masai and Smriti Vidyarthi. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. Flora Atieno is presenting in sign language. Now, senators are threatening to disrupt the reading of the budget if there is no agreement on the Division of Revenue Bill by tomorrow morning. The senators accuse their colleagues in the National Assembly and the national government of frustrating efforts to channel more money to counties, saying it's becoming a habit that they should, be, that they should beg, I should say, for a sizable share of the national cake to go to counties. The senators say it is illegal for the National Treasury to go ahead and read the budget, yet there is no agreement on the division of revenue. NTV's political affairs reporter Kennedy Moredi reports on the intrigues. A stalemate between the national government and the Senate persists over how much money should be forwarded to counties in the 2019-2020 financial year. Today, at a meeting with the Commission for Revenue Allocation, Senators voiced their frustrations in their ongoing mediation that has representatives from both houses. According to senators, their efforts to fight for more cash to counties have been met with resistance from their counterparts in the National Assembly, who they accuse of using all manner of reasons to defeat their quest. The ongoing mediation is stuck at senators insisting on 327 billion shillings for the 2019-2020 financial year while the National Assembly is stuck at $316 billion. If for any reason the, 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 we are going to be taken to a meeting tomorrow to appear as if we are rubber-stamming the budget, we will not agree to those things. But let me warn our National Treasury. Division of Revenue Bill has not been determined, it has not been assented to by the President. They are reading a budget tomorrow. It's illegal. It's unconstitutional. The Senate is accusing their counterparts in the National Assembly, backed by the national government, of bulldozing their way into imposing monies that should be forwarded to counties without listening to their concerns. We'll make it an issue that the Treasury should not flout our law, our constitution, the way they want to do. There's no budget. Article 218 of the Constitution says that the two levels of government will divide revenue by constitutional revenue. Thereafter, CARA will be made. And thereafter, the budget estimates for the national government will be tabled in the National Assembly. But we don't want... What figure are they using? What share are they using? We don't want a division of revenue, which is a very serious issue for this country, to appear to be taken for granted. It can also, and not, can also appear casual. It cannot be treated casually, because this is how you begin to kill the evolution. The Kenya Human Rights Commission has also filed a petition at the Machakos Law Courts with a view to stopping the tabling of the budget Thursday afternoon by the Treasury arguing it is illegal and unconstitutional to do it without following due process. The case will be heard Thursday morning. It is a requirement that all the East African countries read the budget on the same day and at the same time, but this confusion in Kenya that is being caused by the Mediation Committee and an impending court case may just jeopardize the budget reading in the country. Kennedy Muredi, NTV in Nairobi County.
Well, if they're not successful in stopping this particular budget reading, the National Treasury Cabinet Secretary, Henry Rotich, is tomorrow uh, going to be tabling the national budget for the financial year running between July 2019 and June 2020. Well, as you've heard, this comes even as uncertainty hangs over that Division of Revenue bill, which ideally should guide how the national revenue is split between the national and county governments and hence guide a large part of the budget. Julian Samboko sat with the CS to look into this and other issues. Now behind me is the office of the Treasury Cabinet Secretary, Henry Rotich, and at this point, being the 11th hour, he is coming through the budget to ensure all T's are crossed and all I's are dotted pertaining the details in the document. Now I spoke to him regarding the potential stalemate with the Senate, which has indicated that the Division of Revenue Bill has not been passed, and this should be a predicate for the budget preparation. Now this is what he had to say. The consultation happened you know when we were, we were uh, when we were preparing the budget we did add a meeting with the uh, governors uh, so unfortunately we didn't reach also uh, an, an agreement uh, and then uh, and then of course the division of revenue bills were prepared as per the the law the pfm law which says that by 15th of february i should submit I should submit a budget policy statement together with the Division of Revenue Bill, together with the County Allocation of Revenue and the Medium Term Debt. Tomorrow we anticipate that there are potentially more tax measures to be rolled out by the National Treasury, but the Cabinet Secretary is of the view that Kenya, comparatively, is actually enjoying a favourable tax environment. Okay, let's look at Ghana, Zambia, maybe that's a level. What is their tax rate? Are they zero? Are they 15? Are they taxing people at 15? No, they are in 30. Some are in 32. So why in Kenya we look like we complain and yet our neighbors here are having the same tax system? Sure. Yeah, Uganda, Tanzania, all of them are at 30. VAT in Uganda is 18%. VAT in Tanzania is, is 18%. We are 16%. Why are we, why are we complaining? Now all eyes shift to the National Treasury come tomorrow with the budget statement being tabled at Parliament by 3 p.m. as required by the law. Now NTV will be giving you a wall-to-wall -wall coverage to ensure that you get the fine details of this and what this means for your pocket. Julian's Amboko, NTV. Well, we'll be covering that event live for you tomorrow, so make sure you tune in as early as 6 a.m. as we'll have everything you need to know. Now, Treasury Cabinet Secretary Henry Rotich is a man who finds it very difficult to say no. Faced with two decisions, Kenya's most powerful man in the public financial sector will run with the option that brings to his doorstep the least problems, at least in the short term. While economists would cringe at any expenditure and would shy away when they get any whiff that it is an extravagant spend. Rotich is not that type of an economist and so tomorrow he will explain how he intends to spend three trillion shillings in the new financial year which starts in two weeks. Well, in the Daily Nation tomorrow read about the most intriguing details in the biggest expenditure plan for the country since independence. Three trillion shillings can hire five million graduates in various sectors with a starting salary of 50,000 shillings each and also pay their salaries for a whole year. And think about this. If you were to spend 30 million sh every day, shillings every day, it will take you 274 years to exhaust it. So how does Rotich plan to spend this colossal amount in one year and where will it come from? Well, for answers to these and more, don't miss your copy of The Daily Nation tomorrow. And there's an opportunity for you to weigh in on that. Uh, what are your expectations, we asked tonight on Opinion Count? What are your expectations ahead of the budget reading tomorrow? You can send us a tweet on at Mark Masai, at Smriti Vidyarthi or at NTV Kenya and also text us 20686 is the number and we'll sample some of your views later tonight. 
Away from the budget, tonight we can report the controversy surrounding the operations of Kenya's most expensive infrastructure project. The standard gauge railway appears to be getting even murkier. Officials from the Transport Ministry, the Kenya Railways and China Road and Bridge Corporation remain tight-lipped on the grave revelations and queries regarding operations and ownership of the project and have resorted to shifting the blame on who should address the matter. The recent revelations by the Sunday Nation regarding the existence of local minority shareholders at the Africa Star Railways Company, which operates the SGR, appear to have caught all the agencies in charge of the project by surprise and thrown them into confusion. In a newspaper notice published without the company's logo and which only served to deny allegations of presence of local ownership, Africa Star Railways Company had indicated plot number 330-265 in Lovington as its physical address. But when NTV toured the heavily guarded address this morning... You know, in the, uh, in the uh, statement yeah. published today, yesterday, yeah. today actually, today, actually yeah. They used the wrong address. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah they put 265. Yeah, they put it here. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that happened. Officials from CRBC denied existence of any Africa Star officers at the address. While the Transport Ministry had initially referred journalists to CRBC and Kenya Railways regarding the matter, both parties are yet to exhaustively address the issue. According to documents in our possession, the operating company is charging Kenya Railways costly operating and maintenance costs, including a 30 billion shillings fee note sent late last month, leaving the company operating at a lost position. Since its launch in 2017, the financial viability of the SGR has remained a subject of debate, with the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics seemingly unable to settle on what between 5.7 billion shillings and 10.3 billion shillings is the SGR's actual revenue in its first year of operation. Earlier this month, Transport Cabinet Secretary James Masharia said assessing the SGR's viability using its financial performance was pointless. The PNL of a railway service is meaningless. What is important is the service is providing. That's what you must be looking at. Let's not confuse matters by saying SGR is loss making. That does not make sense at all to say that. What is important is to say is it serving the Kenyans? Uh, is it serving um, the purpose for which it was set up? The Standard Gauge Railway has already ferried at least 4 million passengers and 382,000 containers since May 2017. But it's the project's over 1 billion shillings monthly operating costs, which is double the revenues generated monthly, that has fueled concerns over the project's economic viability. Victor Kiprop, NTV. Well, still on transport matters and the announcement by the government that an independent firm would be formed to run the 1.6 billion shilling high capacity buses ends months of speculation on how the bus rapid transport system would be operated. But, and this is a big but, it opens up a new debate on what seems to be a new approach by the government to form special entities for particular purposes. Over the last weekend, as mentioned in Victor Kiprop's story, the Sunday Nation revealed that the state-owned China Road and Bridge Corporation had outsourced the SGR to another company, Africa Star Railway Operation Company Limited, where it holds majority shares. NTV's Ken Majungu reports that the existence of the special purpose entities breeds more speculation than certification. When bus rapid transport system was muted, it sounded more of an answer to a probing problem on the city roads, especially during rush hours. It was generally designed to improve the city's public transport network relative to conventional buses. It is not possible to do things in 30 days. Straight after the Nairobi Regeneration Team made this announcement, the contractor descended on the busy thicker superhighway, a perfect place to begin this experiment. Red lines were drawn to mark a new dawn in city transport, bringing hope and anxiety alike to commuters and businessmen. The overall picture was perfect, and when the announcement on the buses that were to ply the designated section was made, the benefits appeared almost too good to be true. Months on, the deadline for the buses' arrival came and went. No buses arrived, 
and an alternative plan was mooted but which also failed to take off and the cycle of inconvenience continued. After much back and forth, the 1.6 billion project looks likely to eventually take off but with a new twist. The Transport Cabinet Secretary James Mashari announced that the ministry will establish a firm with representation from the public and private sector to operate the 64 high-capacity buses aimed at easing traffic in Nairobi. This move had already been faulted by some stakeholders. Matatu Owners Association Chairperson Simon Kimutai had stated that if the government is buying the buses, it should operate the buses. And if it wants the private sector to operate BRT, then they should be able to buy the buses. But the critical thing is not even NYS. The critical thing is to make sure that we have an efficient transport system, very fast and also very modern. Because as we do these buses, we have to make sure that uh, anybody can use them. Many cities have parastatals managing public transport such as TFL in London and the Metropolitan Transport Authority in New York. Closer home, Tanzania set up the DART parastatal to operate its fleet of rapid transport buses in Jerusalem. What's left now is the unanswered question of who will be in the special purpose institution and whose interests they will be protecting. The other question is how are the major roads such as the Outer Ring Road without the designated dedicated bus lanes will accommodate the buses. This is why some stakeholders believe the government indeed put the cart before the horse. Ken Mijungu, NTV. Not sure whether to call this good news or bad news, but your members of parliament will continue to miss out on the hefty housing allowances they awarded themselves after the High Court today extended orders freezing further payments. The MPs had moved to court to ask for the lifting of the order pending the hearing of a suit filed by the Salaries and Remuneration Commission to oppose the allowances. SRC had sued Parliament on grounds that the move to award each MP 250,000 shillings in the form of housing allowance was illegal. NTV's Silas Apollo reports. It was the beginning of what promises to be a battle of wit and might between the Salaries and Remuneration Commission and members of Parliament. The fight is over the decision by the Parliamentary Service Commission to give each MP 250,000 shillings as housing allowance, but which SRC has termed as illegal, even as an APRO from the public greeted the decision by Parliament. The notice of motion filed by the SRC and in their defense today, submitted by their lawyer Tom Ogienda, the MPs say that the submissions by the SRC, which is the petitioner, were done without providing proof and facts that the MPs were indeed paid money in the form of housing allowances. They say that as such, the order freezing the payments was done unlawfully. They further argue that it is the responsibility of Parliament through the Parliamentary Service Commission to facilitate their stay and well-being outside of their constituencies and that awarding them their allowances was in order. This is the body that makes laws for this country. And all we are saying is that they should be enabled to continue with their work. If an order is made by the court that stands in the way of the legislative duty of parliamentarians, then the court, the court must be told. The MPs are of the view that given the fact that they have two workstations, which is their constituencies and parliament in Nairobi, it is in order that they be facilitated to carry out that mandate. Further, they added that contrary to the arguments by SRC, that the new allowances would lead to an additional monthly expense of 99.5 million shillings to the taxpayer. The said funds were incurred as part of the budget allocated to Parliament and which had already been approved. Order number 13. SRC had in its arguments before court stated that the move was not only illegal but irrational and costly to the taxpayer and the country. SRC says that MPs already enjoy generous perks besides their salaries and therefore awarding them more pay amounts to prejudice and a disregard of the rule of law. This is besides a failure by the Parliamentary Service Commission to consult with the SRC to award the allowances. 
Members of Parliament now have at least two more weeks before they can know the fate of their pending house allowances. Even as the courts move in to deliberate on the stalemate, pitting them against the Salaries and Remuneration Commission. I certify the application urgent and I direct the parties who have not been served to be served today. Sailors Apollo, NTV. Right, let's bring you the update from another of our top stories tonight. And screening against the Ebola virus has been intensified at the Busia border following an outbreak of the disease in eastern Uganda. The Ministry of Health in Uganda says two more people have tested positive for the virus, with the first person to test positive, a five-year-old boy, dying today at Kasese in Uganda. The boy had traveled from the Democratic Republic of Congo with his family, which is currently isolated. At the Busia one-stop border post, the gateway to Kenya from the western part of the country, health officials are on high alert. Screening against the Ebola virus has been intensified. Tumechukua mkakati ya kuhakikisha kwamba ugonjwa wa Ebola inasuiwa kwa kila namna kuingia Kenya. All travelers accessing Kenya from Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan have to be tested. This heightened watchfulness triggered by reports of an outbreak in Kasese, Eastern Uganda after a boy tested positive to the virus two days ago. The five-year-old who has been receiving Ebola treatment at the Buera Hospital died in the morning. The Minister of Health in Uganda, Jane Asenga, says so far three people have tested positive for the Ebola virus. They are all from the boy's family. The family had traveled to the Democratic Republic of Congo on the 9th of this month to attend their grandfather's funeral. He died of Ebola. All the other Congolese family members have been identified and are in isolation at Buera Hospital. Eight other people who had direct contact with the family have been isolated. Security officials are searching for the boy's uncle who is at large. The Ministry of Health, WHO and CDC will undertake ring vaccination of contacts to the case and other non-vaccinated frontline health workers as well as other workers beginning 14th June 2019. Ebola outbreak in DRC started in August last year. Up to now, there have been over 2,000 reported cases and 1,390 deaths. Sharon Baranga, NTV. We'll definitely keep an eye on the screening process on that. And earlier we had asked what your expectations are ahead of tomorrow's budget reading. We have a couple uh, of responses. Uh, Oguna Ogna, you say nothing much is expected to change. So many budgets have been read, but we have not seen any change in lifestyle. We now take it as an order of operations. Uh, Ruguru, Ruguru Mwaura, you say I'm expecting the prices of foodstuffs to be considered. Watu anaumia. They are very expensive. Here, here. All right. Well, thanks for your contribution. Of course, keep your comments coming in, and we'll sample more at the end of this broadcast. Time for a breather on NTV tonight. Stay with us. There's more. I help women find independence by training them in fish farming. Oh, it's tough on my back. It can cause headaches.
the Anthony. Thanks for staying with us. A five-judge bench has ruled that abortion is still legal in the country within the parameters provided for by the Constitution and that the withdrawal of the guidelines on safe abortions in the country by the Ministry of Health was unconstitutional and infringed on the rights of women and girls. That's right. The, the ruling that abortion is still illegal uh, was also uh, put in by this particular case uh, that was uh, put forward by civil rights group FIDA, Kenya Human Rights Commission, among others. There were celebrations at the Milimani locals after the five-judge bench ruling came to an end. The High Court ruled that the Ministry of Health was unreasonable, drastic, and did not follow the law. On how the restrictions on the right on race can be applied. FIDA, KHRS, Center for Reproductive Rights, had sued the government for withdrawing the guidelines and issuing a memo through their Office of Director of Medical Services to all public and private health workers not to participate in trainings on safe abortions as abortion is illegal, a memo which was also squashed by the High Court. Yes, the court has affirmed that in fact rape is a ground for um, abortion. The court has also affirmed the constitution is very clear, has set the rules. When the trained health professional is of the opinion that the consequence of that rape will affect the mental health, then they are, um, they can access that rape. The petitioners had filed to have abortion permitted in cases such as sexual violence. The court ruled abortion in cases of sexual violence are only permitted within the provision of the law when determined by a qualified professional in the event that it will risk the health of the girl or woman, for instance, risking their physical or mental health. What the court has done today for us is pronounced that women actually have rights mm -hmm. and their rights are enshrined in the constitution and nobody including the Ministry of Health, including the DMS, including the government can take away those rights by the strike of a pen. What this means is that women will not needlessly die from unsafe abortions. Doctors and medical providers will have information on when they can procure safe abortion, how they can procure safe abortion, uh, at what gestational period ETC. The Ministry of Health had withdrawn the guidelines in 2015, stating that they had opened an opportunity for quacks in backstreet clinics to terminate pregnancies on request and that the withdrawal would allow for more consultations. Further, the High Court has ordered the payment of 3 million shillings to the mother of the minor, the first petitioner, who succumbed to unsafe abortion complications. The ruling by the judges today kicks back the ball to the Minister of Health to relook at the standards and guidelines for reducing mortality and morbidity due to unsafe abortions in the country. Eunice Omolo, NTV, Nairobi. Nairobi Governor Mike Mbuvi Sonko says motorists in the city will enjoy free parking as his administration works on fine-tuning the new e-revenue system. The declaration comes uh, means rather that the county will be losing tens of millions of shillings daily after the county parted ways with Jambo Pay, which was contracted to collect revenue on its behalf. Well, Sonko says the lost revenues are nothing compared to monies lost in the corruption area at the national level. NTV Zainab Ismail reports on Governor Mike Sonko's big fail. I don't know why people are bitter. If motorists don't pay parking for a day or two, you see us at Iowatu, you necessarily Nairobi the county under my administration. So let them Nairobians enjoy free parking. What is the big deal? This hour, I was polypa. As motorists in Nairobi bask in the free parking window period occasioned by the e revenue collection system hitches, the capital city continues to bleed in terms of revenue collection. We've uh, seen uh, days that we have done over 120 million in a day. Uh, and so we, well, it depends on the season and, and so forth. But uh, we, I, I think we have had uh, days that we have got into over 120 million in a day collections for the city. In just the last three days, the county is estimated to have lost millions of shillings that would have been collected as parking revenue. The Sonko-led administration introduced the new internal system to collect levies and fees on Monday following the expiry of its five-year contract with electronic payment firm Jumbo Pay in what it said would save millions of shillings paid as commissions to Jumbo Pay for automating revenue streams. 
The taxpayers' money, Haipote. Unlike the other one for Jumbo Pay. I don't want to talk bad about Jumbo Pay, yeah, because uh, the contract was signed in 2014. It was supposed to end just a, a few months ago. But there was a lot of laxity from uh, relocating from Jumbo Pay to our own uh, revenue collection system, simply because there was a lot of sabotage. Jumbo Pay has given uh, our system to the city so that they could work with their experts and other personnel and uh, probably other partners to operationalize the same or other solutions that uh, that's right apologies for the picture frame in that shot we will try bring you that story as and when we can and it is of course something that we will be following all right now let's bring you another story and the riddle of the look-alike girls from kakamega who were united by social media will be unraveled soon as the dna test results are ready the three are preparing to travel to nairobi to receive the test results but they say whatever the outcome it doesn't really matter now we caught up with Mevis, Sharon and Melon at the River Soy in Matunda, Kakamega County, a day before they start their journey. And the three were evidently in a jubilant mood and their friendship has blossomed since they met. The three were unexpectedly thrust into the spotlight and had to deal with its ugly side. The girls who are in different schools are home for the midterm break, but say they will remain close-knit. The results will be positive. I want to assure both moms that they will be our mothers and nothing will ever change that. Because to me, I believe Ndugu ni kufaana na si kufanana. Mara au mepata si watu watatu ni sisters. Mara mepata mmoja si sister yetu. Ivo munafanya wazazi wanakuwa stigmatized. Stigmatized. Adi mzazi mmoja na feel kama ako abandon. Adi kwa sisi watu watatu, mmoja wetu na feel kama ako abandon. Wengine tena wanaeleza wane wanasema mmoja wetu hapa hivi tena ni wakando wawili ndio twins but they <coughs> wache kueneza huduma za uongo All the best to them as they stay together A petition against Bungoma governor Wycliffe Wangamati accusing him of abuse of office and mismanagement of county funds has been tabled before the Senate. The petition filed by Bungoma activist Moses Lukoya wants the governor investigated by the anti-graft agencies. In the petition which is now in the hands of the Senate Committee on Devolution, the activist claims the governor has unprocedurally and illegally employed Ford Kenya party officials on high job groups without following due process. Impunity, na pia kuna embezzlement ya resources za watu wa Bungoma. Yeye anaruhusu kampuni zake ndio zinafanya biashara na ameweka kando kabisa maneno ya sheria. The governor also faces accusations of coercing the county public service board to create illegal offices and appointing eight advisors instead of three. Kwa mambo ya tendering ya wale wa nini upande wa procurement ameflout tukienda upande wa functions za national anachukua pesa ya county ambayo ime what evolved if any necessary i mean the functions that come out of the time at our and it was in guinea i message you can i got a project account as a national government according to the petition wangamati created a service delivery unit which lukoye claims is a duplication of the roles of the county public service board bungoma senator moses wetangula has cast doubts on the petition of the allegations are clearly outrageous and ill-founded. For instance, for example, Mr. Speaker, Bungoma has an annual budget of 10 billion, so 2.7 billion wage bill cannot be 54 percent, even if you fail mathematics. The petitioner wants the Senate to direct the Auditor General to conduct a special audit of the county. The Senate committee has 60 days to consider the petition and table its report. The petitioner says he moved to Senate after the Bungoma County Assembly threw out his petition. He is accusing the Assembly of failure in its oversight role. Vincent Odur, NTV, Nairobi. Now the government will not be issuing work permits to foreign nationals upon arrival 
in the country. They will be required to apply for the work permit in their country of origin. Interior Cabinet Secretary Dr. Fred Matiangi also says there will be no tolerance for political incitement now and in the run-up to the 2022 elections. The CS opened the first among four e-passport issuing centres outside Nairobi in Eldoret, Kisi, Embu, while Washington, London, Paris, Beijing, Dubai and Pretoria will serve Kenyans in the diaspora. We are not issuing work permits to traders because we don't do that as government. We don't have a classification of work permits called traders. And any people who are in markets and so on who are trying to trade, those are illegal immigrants. They are here illegally. And our security team understands that. We will deport them. The six in Nairobi, there were six. Wale Sita, Walikuwa Nairobi. Walionekana kwa market huko. Wao wao tu by tomorrow watakuwa wanakula sapa kwao because tutawarudisha kwao. You're watching NTV tonight. The business news is coming up next with Julian Zamboko. Don't go far. Time to get down to business. Welcome, I am Julian Amboko. Now, how much do you spend on food on a daily basis? Your answer is most likely not the same as it would have been a few years ago. This tells a tale of the reality of the economy. On the day before the reading of the national budget, NTV's Charity Mwangi visited a family in Nairobi's Mukuru Kwanjenga slum, where she sought to understand the cost of living with a key interest on the food budget of a family of six.
wading through the mud appropriately dressed with boots to boot, an experience that some feel is symbolic of life in the Kenyan economy. Grace Ngaiza, a resident of Mukuruku and Jenga slums, takes us to her shop of choice, where she will get the most ideal prizes to fit her family's limited income. Mtu anafanya mjengo kama sisi hapa. Mzi anafanya mjengo. Na ni mtu wa mkono, si fundi. Aa, ana, anapata miatano. Piga miatano hiyo budget na tuko watu sita. The 500 shillings her husband makes is spent on food. They pay 3,000 shillings for rent every month. And they have many other basic obligations which make the mathematics difficult to make sense. She says they get by somehow. Her expenditure is elaborate and her mission is to always make her shillings spread far enough to meet their basic needs. They can neither afford luxuries nor expect too much of a meal. Yo sasa ni unaweza pika tu chakula at least ya watu kukula tu ishikilia tumbo at si ile ya kushiba. Bora tu watu wakule kitu ishike tumbo. For lunch she prepares rice and bean stew. She bought the beans for 45 shillings a kilogram. The rice cost her 55 shillings a kilo. She bought cooking oil worth 100 shillings, tomatoes for 20 shillings and 10 shillings for the onions. Every meal is carefully prepared, observing high standards of hygiene. Grace says she cannot afford health care, and so their mantra is inevitably, prevention is better than cure. Sasa hata nikipata, tuseme mtu wakini saidi anangiri mbili. Na kwa nyumba sina chakuli. Unajua sita enda ozi. The budget reading has in the past spelled steeper times for low-income earners. The struggle for the basics is so strong that Grace, like many others, sees little value in the larger projects that the government rolls out, borrows for, and funds. She feels the government is out of touch with Wanjiku. Tuseme mtu kama mi na izaka apata, tuseme tu manzi sijaenda maali, iyo sabarabara hija nisaidia. As the government continues to focus on development projects that factor significantly on every year's budget, it seems that Nairobi residents care very little for the said projects, as their main concern is food for their families. Charity Mwangi, NTV. And that story by Tariti reminds us that indirect taxes hit the bottom of the pyramid hardest. Elsewhere, but staying with the budget, farmers in the Rift Valley, the country's food basket, have decried the declining trend of allocation to agriculture despite the sector's huge contribution to the country's gross domestic product. They say the move has impacted negatively on food security. Lois Wangori spoke to farmers from Morris Bridge who stated their disappointment with the Treasury for failing to maintain, if not increase, monies for the Ministry of Agriculture. Some maize farmers in the Rift Valley have expressed discontentment with the 59.1 billion shillings allocated to agriculture in rural and urban development that the 2019-2020 budget has set aside, an amount they say is a lower allocation than they would want. Their key concern is the likelihood that subsidized farm inputs such as seeds and fertilizer may not be adequately catered for, translating to increased costs of production and less profit profits for maize farmers tumenyanyasika sana kwa sababu sasa wakiondoa hiyo budget ya kisoma aondoe subsidies fertilizers ni kumaanisha kwamba mtu tutarudi kwa ile society ambayo ni eat money eat money society kwa sababu tutakuta mbolea ita hike mpaka 6000 they fear for further injury to a sector that has been hit by decreased crop production poor infrastructure and lack of markets ama tusipopata mbolea ambayo ni subsidized kurudi shamba itakuwa ngumu Parliament has already approved 59.1 billion shillings to be shared by agriculture in rural and urban development. Now, fears arrive that the government has allocated the bulk of the agricultural resources to support large-scale farming and export promotion, a move that may disadvantage small-scale farmers. Mimi ningependa kuambia pina Mr. Rotich ya kwamba tunashanga hawa ni watoto wanatoka zemu ya za Rift Valley wabunge wetu wengi wanatoka Rift Valley lakini tunashangani kwa nini walipunguza budget ya wakulima Luis Ongoi NTV Business Eldoret
And away from the budget, let's move on to Mata's currency. Now, the new currency banknotes have started trickling into circulation a bit more, with various banks having completed calibration of the automated teller machines to recognize and dispense the new notes alongside the old ones. The new notes being launched almost two weeks ago, banks had to upgrade and reconfigure ATMs. Accessing the new currency notes over the counter is yet to pick up, as much other various banks are still fitting money counting machines on the teller booths. However, the currency change and the stringent exchange policies have created difficulties for Ugandan business people hoping to exchange their old Kenyan currency notes. NTV's Uganda Andrew Chamagero reports. Uganda has joined Tanzania to suspend the conversion of Kenyan shillings in an effort to stop its banks from being used to loan the dirty money back into Kenya. However, suspending the conversion of Kenyan shillings has caused a more disruption for business people trading between Uganda and Kenya. We find a problem in the giving out and receiving the money because when we receive the market is low that's at the rate is we have we have been selling kenya 37 37.4 but right now we are in 32 traders are stuck with the kenyan currency because they cannot exchange it in uganda and banks can't allow them to bank it no, the bank is not receiving it is uh, quite disruptive for us as traders in the fx market but even more so to the Ugandan traders who are stuck. Many traders say they have seen a decline in business volumes. The confusion caused by the new Kenyan currency can easily be taken advantage of by fraudsters and counterfeiters, especially at border points where currency exchange is quick and informal. That's why Bushia Mayor Hassan Bwire has cautioned the public to be more vigilant. I'm requesting people to be very careful, to be very vigilant, and to to be sure of what you are receiving, more especially in terms of Kenya currency, as per now. Bus companies operating between Uganda and Kenya have also felt the pinch of the new currency regulations. Also, different foreign exchange traders are not certain of the value of the new Kenyan notes, and this custody on the market has created some challenges. Andrew Chamagero, NTV News. Now elsewhere, the Principal Secretary for Petroleum, Andrew Kamau, says the new regulations guiding the liquefied petroleum gas industry have been designed to address the clear failure of the previous, previous model. Rather, The new regulations will see consumers purchasing gas cylinders for the first time, part with a refundable deposit. The regulations are geared at enhancing safety and integrity in the industry, promoting cleaner fuel and ideally leading to reduced costs of the commodity. And basically what we're saying is the old model did not work, where you could give cylinders to anybody, and those people, they were just filling uh, other people's cylinders illegally. And it was very difficult to police because you could have anybody's cylinders. For example, Total, they only have about 300 odd distributors in Kenya, yet their cylinders are available in about 4,000 outlets. I would rather be safe than convenient, because yes, this convenience, you read in the newspapers from time to time, a cylinder has exploded. Who do you hold responsible for that? Do you know where that cylinder was filled? Do you know when it was last validated? You don't know any of those things. Who do you hold accountable? And that's it for the Business Bulletin tonight. Do enjoy the rest of your viewing. Making my family some nutritious porridge is a painstaking process. First, I have to find all the needed.
Welcome back. The echoes of the book The River and the Source ring eight years after the death of its author Margaret Ogola. Now, the United States tech giant Google has honored the late novelist, pediatrician and human rights activist with a powerful animated doodle of the late author who would have been 60 years old today. She passed away after a long battle with cancer on the 21st of September 2011 and is survived by her husband, Dr. George Ogola, four children and two foster children. Margaret's literary pieces are still timeless to this day, particularly her masterpiece, The River and the Source, which gave schools across the country an award-winning set book between 1998 and 2001. And to other stories making headlines around the world and there, there are uh, some issues in Sudan's capital after an opposition alliance called off a nationwide civil disobedience campaign and agreed to new talks. Well, the breakthrough in the standoff between the military rulers who toppled veteran leader Omar al-Bashir and protesters demanding civilian rule followed mediation led by Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Around 120 people have been killed since the crackdown began, according to doctors close to the protesters. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa is under investigation by the country's anti-corruption watchdog of an equivalent of 3.5 million Kenya shillings suspect donation to his campaign fund from a company facing extensive graft allegations. The inquiry against him centers on complaints by the opposition over payment from Bosasa, a company that corruptly won huge government tenders under Zuma's tenure. And finally, in Hong Kong, riot police fired tear gas, water cannons and a pepper spray after thousands of protesters surrounded the legislature and forced a delay in a debate over a controversial extradition bill. What was a relatively peaceful demonstration erupted as hundreds of protesters tried to storm the legislative council complex, prom prompting police to retaliate. Well, critics say that the bill will undermine the city's civil freedoms in its, quote, one country, two systems political structure. Time for another break. Brown Atwal is preparing to bring you the sports of the day. Harambe Stars coach Sebastian Minier will depend on three strikers experienced Michael Olunga, unattached Masood Juma and youngster John Avire to lead his charges up front at the Africa Cup of Nations. With nine days to go before the Continental Showpiece kicks off in Cairo, Egypt, we focus on the man tasked with poaching the goals for Kenya, which is making a return to the AFCON after a 15-year absence. To AFCON 2019 in association with GoTV. 
As a 21-year-old, Michael Olunga was crowned as the 2015 Kenyan Premier League Player of the Year. Having scaled the heights in local football, Olunga has in the past four seasons plied his trade in Sweden, China and Spain. He now turns out for Japanese side Kashiwa Rizal. With 32 caps and 14 goals, Olunga is the most experienced striker in the team and the spotlight will be on him. No, I'm not under any pressure because, uh, you know, of course, many people will be relying, you know, on you and, um, you know, but uh, at the end of the day, it's teamwork. So, like they say, Rome is not built in one day. But for sure, when we step into that pitch, we are going to fight for the country. We are going to give it our level best. So for Packers, John Avire, who finished the Kenyan Premier League season with seven goals, made his senior team debut in the Madagascar pre-Afcon friendly, earning the praise of his coach. Avira is part of the youthful members of the squad who coach Sebastian Minye hopes will be the future of Kenyan football. I believe I can give my best. Now with the time I'm going to show those who didn't know me better, I'm going to show them what I'm, what I'm capable of doing so that I can help the team. Minye's third pick, Masood Juma, who is unattached, has caused widespread mostly negative debate among Kenyan football fans. Everybody thinks that uh, when you get the, the call up, it's, it's just uh, the favor from the Football Kenya Federation chairman, Nick Mwenda, which is not true. You know, when you're on the national team, you deserve it. I would say that they hate players, maybe they hate the club, you know. The former Karabangi Sharks forward, who has scored three goals in seven appearances for the Stars, believes he has national team pedigree despite currently being clubless. I don't have to prove anything because. Uh, I, missed, I missed 11 games and I scored 17 goals in 23 matches and that's enough my friend to, to answer all those who criticize me and sometimes it gives me the, uh, the strength to work hard and achieve what I want. With Minya the helm, Kenya has announced his defense side conceding only one goal during the Afghan qualifiers but its attack is not up to scratch with only four goals in six matches. This is the record Olunga, Masood and Avire will be out to improve in Stars' sixth appearance at the Continental Extravaganza. There could have been some players with more experience in the squad, uh, but the coach has made it clear that uh, he's looking to the future just as he's looking to the present. Uh, so uh, we wait and see if he's going to be able to deliver with the squad he's picked. The team chemistry is the most important thing. You might have good players, but without the team chemistry, it's going to be a struggle in the pitch. First test will be up against the Democratic Republic of Congo on Saturday in their second pre-Afcon friendly. It will be a, a good match to, to learn again and to prepare well our future games against Algeria, Tanzania and Senegal, of course. If we want to build something strong, step by step. But I'm, we need to continue to dream. I'm a dreamer. At Afcon, Kenya will be up against Senegal, Algeria and Tanzania in Group C. Road to Afcon 2019 in association with Go TV. Experience the unforgettable with the Total Africa Cup of Nations with Super Sport on Go TV. Go TV, live it, love it. Proudly brought to you by Betin. Kenyan marathon runner Felix Kirwa has been banned for nine months after testing positive for strike nine, a drug commonly known as rat poison. According to the Athletics Integrity Unit, Kirwa has been banned until November 14th and disqualified from his second place finish at the Singapore Marathon in December 2018. Kirwa is the brother of 2016 Olympic women's marathon silver medalist Eunice Kirwa, who ran for Bahrain at the Games and was provisionally suspended last month after testing positive for EPO. Strychnine is on the anti-doping list due to its effects as a stimulant and can give an athlete the ability to go for longer without feeling tired. That's a new law in doping. Moving on, African representatives Nigeria got their Women's World Cup campaign up and running after seeing off South, South Korea 2-0 in France. The Super Falcons beat, uh, beaten their open Beaten in their opening game by Norway, bounced back courtesy of an own goal by Korea's Kim Dion and assisted Oshuala's fine second half strike. Oshuala, a three-time African footballer of the year, who won on, goal, on the Golden Ball and Golden Boot at the Under-20 World Cup in 2014, and the line reputation as well.
for sports considering some events will be happening also next year. That has been the sports. I love, have a good night. My name is Brian Otwal. Right, before we close, remember that we had asked for your comments ahead of tomorrow's budget reading. And uh, Mark, you have... Yes. As you've heard, the sports desk is expecting some money to go to the sports department. Well, let's uh, hear in from uh, our viewers, Lia Gushka. You say what he's expecting, new loopholes for theft of public funds by failed incompetent government. And uh, Stallone254, you say nothing new, Kenya, ni leile etu. Maybe the monkeys are just changing the forest. And uh, Stephen Wangi, you say my expectations are that the government should complete the ongoing projects and should avoid taking new projects that end up being embezzled by the corrupt. I also expect the government to increase funding the youth and stabilizing food prices. Another one on the food. Yeah, a lot of you seem to have uh, similar sentiments. Thanks for your contribution on NTV tonight. Thanks to Flora Atieno, our sign language interpreter. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi. We'll see you again tomorrow. My name is Mark Masai. Have a good night. This is NTV.